This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Thursday, October 3rd. This is Africa 54. The United States Health and Human Services Secretary makes his first visit to the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ethiopian President Saleh Woki Zode reveals what inspired her to pursue a political career and where she sees the country going. And as Democrats prepare subpoenas, U.S. President Donald Trump renews accusations of treason against his congressional foes. The deadly Ebola virus is once again spreading rapidly and terrorizing residents in several African countries. The Democratic Republic of Congo is in particular peril. VOA traveled with U.S. health officials in mid-September to the epicenter of the outbreak along the country's remote northeast border. The U.S.-led delegation brought hope and medicine to the region, but serious challenges remain. VOA correspondent Mil Asega was on the trip and reports from DRC. It's a journey few Westerners will make over rainforests and active volcanoes, past the winding, dusty roads leading to the remote village of Butembo. Here, elbow bumps replace handshakes. Shoes and hands are disinfected. Anyone who enters, check for fever. This is U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar's first visit to the Ebola Treatment Center in Butembo, the front line in the battle to stop the deadly virus. It's an incredibly tragic situation, especially to see the children. So many, so many children. I think that probably was one of the things that struck me the most were how many kids are here. But I also came away with more hope than I thought I would. The outbreak began last year. It's now the second worst ever. More than 3,000 people infected, more than 2,000 dead. But there is hope for a cure, the development of two new drugs synthesized from the blood of an Ebola-resistant patient. You know, it's a game changer. I mean, it's a game changer. Dr. Anthony Fauci was part of the team that helped develop the new drugs. Not a cure exactly, but extremely effective. When you say a cure, it's almost as if everybody who gets it is now going to be okay. There are still going to be people who come in so advanced that no drug is going to help them. But clearly, if you get one or the other of these two drugs, you dramatically diminish the mortality of Ebola. But cultural mistrust is common here. Some believe Ebola is not a virus, but a man-made poison. The misguided perception of Ebola treatment centers in the past has been that sick people would walk in into these centers and they would ultimately leave either in a body bag or in a coffin. But there's a lot of people in this community working hard to change that perception. Among them, Mulyanza Huguet. The young woman made a full recovery after receiving the experimental drug monoclonal antibody 114. Today, she goes from village to village, urging families to seek early treatment. Another serious challenge is security. More than 100 warring factions vie for dominance along the porous eastern borders of the Congo. In this part of the world, protecting health workers is a full-time job. Thousand of you know security incidents, and any time you have disruption in your intervention, of course the virus will replicate, and we will, you have to catch up. So it's taking a lot of energy and time. The United States has already invested over 300 million dollars to develop anti-Ebola vaccines and treatments. Secretary Azar hopes his visit demonstrates America's commitment to the region. If it helps reinforce the fact that we're, we were in this before the first Ebola case and we're going to be there after the last Ebola case and we're, it's a part of a community effort and community engagement, well, then I'm, I'm delighted if it had any impact. Milar Sega, VOA News in Butembo, DRC. The United Nations says nearly 600 refugees are returning home to Burundi Thursday after departing Tanzania. The refugees are the first group in a mass repatriation that some migrants fear could force them back against their will. 
hundreds of thousands of Burundians fled a surge of political violence in 2015 when President Pierre Nkurunziza ran for a third disputed term in office and opponents accused him of breaching the constitution. A UN commission on Burundi reported in September that there was risk of a fresh wave of atrocities as the nation approached the 2020 election with its political crisis unresolved. Burundi and Tanzania agreed in August to start repatriating 200,000 refugees, saying that conditions in Burundi had improved. Tanzania and the UN say all of Thursday's returns had been voluntary. Hundreds of wives and children of Malian soldiers demonstrated Wednesday in Bamako. They are demanding information from the government after at least 25 soldiers were killed and 60 went missing in attacks by suspected jihadists. The raids on two army camps Monday in central Mali were among the deadliest this year against soldiers struggling to repel increasingly brazen attacks by militant groups, some with links to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. The roughly 300 protesters who gathered in front of a military base accused army chiefs of withholding needed resources from soldiers in the field. Rwandan prosecutors on Wednesday charged 25 men with treason and other crimes related to their alleged activities in a rebel group founded by a South African-based dissident. The suspects are expected in court Thursday to make a plea. The men appeared in a military court Wednesday in Kigali for the first time since being repatriated in June from neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo, where they were captured. The suspects included Habibu Mudathiru, a former Rwandan soldier who prosecutors say was in charge of operations and training in Congo for the Rwanda National Congress, a rebel group founded by Kayumba Nyamwasa. Yamwasa, a former ally of President Paul Kagame, is now a Rwandese dissident based in South Africa. In the past, Rwanda has accused Uganda and Burundi of working with Kayumba's rebel group in a bid to remove Kagame from office. Relations between Rwanda and its two neighbors have since been strained. Now, the start of Somalia school year marks the first time since its civil war broke out that the government has issued a new curriculum for students. Serena Chondri explains. These Somali children are used to traveling through Mogadishu's battle-scarred streets to get to school. Now they have a different challenge, learning from a new curriculum. The start of the school year marks the first time since the civil war broke out in 1991 that the government has issued a new syllabus for primary and secondary school students. During the war, there were more than 40 curricula used across Somalia. Schools had to make do with whatever they had. Students are coping well with the new curriculum because it's based on their religion, culture and vernacular. They're finding the new curriculum easy to understand. They're learning well under this new curriculum and can even read the books on their own now. Only four out of ten children are enrolled in school in Somalia, one of the lowest rates in the world, according to the United Nations. Education accounts for less than 5% of this year's budget of $344 million. There are undeniable challenges. Right now there are over 30,000 teachers, but only about 22% of those teachers are qualified and certified. You can understand that the quality of students depends on the quality of the teachers. The new books cover English, Arabic, Somali, math, science, Islamic studies, physical education, technology and social studies. The government hopes the new religious studies syllabus will help counter messages being put out by the homegrown Al-Qaeda-linked insurgency, Al-Shabaab. That was Serena Chondri of Reuters reporting. Ethiopian President Sahale Woki Zeude sat down recently for an interview with VOA's Solomon Abate during her visit in New York for the United Nations General Assembly. In part one of the interview, she spoke about what drove her in her career and discussed the current state of the country. I grew up in a family of four girls. I'm the first born.
uh, but uh, I had a very uh, amazing uh, family, especially my father, who has always uh, told us that there is nothing that uh, a woman or a girl cannot do. So this has been my motto all my life. And um, in, in whatever I did, by the way, I was the first woman to do this, the first woman to do that. So I was daring, I was courageous, and I had my self-esteem as well. All this uh, has helped. So I worked, started in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then um, Ministry of um, Education, Foreign Affairs. I was ambassador of Ethiopia for close to two decades um, to many countries and multilateral as well to the African Union. Then I joined the UN as an assistant secretary general and a special representative of the HG to the Central African Republic where my main task was to stabilize the country and um, work on the peace building. And I headed for close to eight years uh, the, the only United Nations headquarters in the Global South, which is based in Nairobi, as its first um, dedicated director general female or male. I was the first one and the first female, of course, uh, with, um, yeah, so uh, with the rank of Undersecretary General. Uh, the last posting in the UN was to the African Union as a special representative of the HG again to the, to the AU before I joined this office. Mm -hmm. That's in a nutshell. Congratulations for becoming, you know, the first Ethiopian president, Your Excellency. And uh, my uh, <coughs> next question would be on uh, the peace and stability of Ethiopia. There are people who are very much concerned about the future of this country. There are people who predict disintegration of that country. Meantime, there are uh, some optimistic views from the public and from the high officials of the country, including the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. How do you characterize the current situation of the country? First of all, I always see the glass half full. If you don't have that perspective, then it can distort your views. Um, second, I think we have to think of where we were like two, three years ago. I think we are in the right path. I think we have, um, this is what we should be doing, consolidate. We have the conducive environment. Of course, it, it, it can be, it can be um, improved as we move on, but we have the, con the conditions now for everybody to come in and to play its role. Um, so if we put the interest of our country first, the interest of our people first, the peace-loving people of Ethiopia, because it's the pe people which, I, which has suffered most uh, uh, whenever we, 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 we lost it. So um, I think we have really to, to come together to draw a red line, not to cross when it comes to peace, uh, because um, it cannot be used as a political expediency. Uh, this is too serious of an issue. Um, so yeah, with all this in mind, and with the conducive situation in Ethiopia, I think we have a, a good opportunity to, to move along. In Friday's part two of the interview with Ethiopian President Sahale Woki Zeude, VOA Solomon Abate asked the president about gender parity in government and what role she hopes to play in ensuring regional security, including Ethiopia's relationship with Egypt and tensions surrounding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Now, scores of senior doctors in Zimbabwe's public hospitals are threatening to strike Thursday unless the government meets their demand for a pay increase and better working conditions. If they walk out, they would join over 500 junior doctors who have been on strike since September 3rd for the same reasons. Doctors have complained that their salaries, less than $200 a month for juniors, barely covers their living expenses. 200 senior doctors, including specialists, are set to walk off their job. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, could crickets hold the key to ending global hunger? We'll be right back.
am Sheka Sully, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We'll pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. The lyrics could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat. The African beat that comes. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. With not enough doctors or death certificates to rely on, more countries are asking family members to help determine what's killing their citizens. Called verbal autopsies, or lay death recording, medical practitioners question relatives on medical history and symptoms after a person has passed away to try to determine the correct cause of death. In Rwanda, only an estimated 20% of deaths occur in hospitals, and there is just one licensed doctor for every 8,000 people, according to data from the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council. About 50 countries have attempted verbal autopsy projects, and the list is growing. Next up, an unusual structure has appeared in the heart of the Rotterdam port in the Netherlands. The floating farm is a venture testing whether small-scale, sustainable dairy farming is feasible in such an environment, far away from rolling green fields of a traditional agribusiness. Power from the farm comes from a solar panel array floating nearby. The farm sells some bottles of raw milk on site to visitors, while the rest is pasteurized and turned into milk or yogurt. And finally, it's an unusual welcome for guests at Tokyo's Hena Hotel which has recently thrown open its doors to customers. The receptionists are a dinosaur, a ninja, and a butler that looks like he came straight out of a Japanese cartoon. Greeting. Each hologram is programmed to speak four languages. In the rooms, a tablet controls room functions, such as the lights, and also shows guests how busy the downstairs restaurant is. It's also full of tourist information, allowing you to make bookings in the local area, as well as information on where to shop, or how to get to local attractions. And that's what's trending today. Now, former U.S. Special Envoy for Ukraine, Kut Volka, is on Capitol Hill testifying before three committees of the House of Representatives Thursday about his involvement in President Donald Trump's dealings with Ukraine. Lawmakers want to know if Volka is linked to a whistleblower's complaint that Trump sought help from Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky to get dirt on his political rival, former Vice President Joe Biden, a Democratic presidential contender, and his son Hunter. Volker is expected to give a deposition in private to staff of the Intelligence, Oversight and Reform and Foreign Affairs Committees, all at the center of an impeachment inquiry involving President Trump. President Trump continues to attack Democrats and a whistleblower who wrote a complaint about the president's phone call with the leader of Ukraine. The president is again accusing them of treason. VOA's Patsy Widakuswara has more. Even as he welcomes Finnish President Sauli Niinistö to the White House, President Donald Trump continues to attack the whistleblower who drew attention to his July call with the president of Ukraine. He either got it totally wrong, made it up, or the person giving the information to the whistleblower was dishonest. And this country has to find out who that person was, because that person's a spy. Democrats move forward with impeachment inquiry as they prepare to subpoena the White House for documents related to the call where Trump pushed for incriminating information about his opponent, former Vice President Joe Biden. The president wants to make this all about the whistleblower and suggest people that come forward with evidence of his wrongdoing are somehow treasonous uh, and should be treated as traitors and spies. Um, this is a blatant effort to intimidate witnesses. 
Uh, it's an incitement to violence. The president repeated his accusation that Adam Schiff committed treason for his public reading and paraphrasing of Trump's call. The language that the president is using right now is quite unprecedented and quite dangerous to accuse sitting members of Congress of treason, um, which is a, a specific statute under uh, federal law with a very specific uh, burden and high burden to me, uh, is inappropriate. Three House committees have scheduled depositions with current and former State Department officials, including Kurt Volker the Ukrainian envoy who resigned last week. And former ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the Democrats are trying to intimidate and bully State Department employees. Pompeo, who is under subpoena, admitted he was on the July phone call. Uh, the phone call was in the context of now, I guess I've been the Secretary of State for uh, coming on a year and a half. Um, I know precisely what the American policy is with respect to Ukraine. Democrats warned that Trump administration efforts to impede a congressional impeachment investigation into the president will be construed as obstruction of justice. Patsy Wida Kuswara, BOA News at the White House. A commemoration was held in Turkey to mark the first anniversary of the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was killed and dismembered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Khashoggi's murder triggered widespread international condemnation of Saudi Arabia, and the calls for justice are continuing. Here's Dorian Jones in Istanbul. The commemoration in Istanbul was a somber affair, held just a few meters from the Saudi consulate where Jamal Khashoggi entered to collect paperwork to get married. But instead, death awaited him at the hands of a Saudi hit squad, suspected of acting on orders of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Khashoggi's fiance, Hatice Cengiz, led today's ceremony. All these amazing and beautiful people know Jamal as a journalist, as a writer, as an activist and a great friend and human being. But to me, he was much more than that. He was my best friend. He was the love of my life. I still love him. Representatives of international human rights groups and friends of the journalists were among those attending the ceremony. Among them, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, an owner of the Washington Post newspaper, which published Khashoggi's columns. You need to know that you are in our hearts. We are here, and you are not alone. Khashoggi's critical columns of Salman are believed to have made him a target. Eleven people have been charged in Saudi Arabia with Khashoggi's murder, some of whom were caught on Turkish security cameras arriving in Istanbul. The Saudi Crown Prince denies any involvement in the killing and rights groups' efforts to hold him accountable are fading. Even world leaders appear anxious to move on from the controversy, says human rights activists. I think it's necessary to remind everyone uh, what sorry states the international order has come to that allows um, a, a state like Saudi Arabia to be able to murder a critical journalist in their own uh, consulate building, um, to remind people how important it is to get justice for Jamal Khashoggi and to make journalists um, all around the world um, safer as a, as a result. Those in Istanbul attending the commemoration pledged to bring all those to account and not to let Khashoggi's murder become a footnote in history. Dorian Jones, VOA News, Istanbul. If food production and the land use does not improve, the world may face unrest and conflict, according to a landmark report. The study by the Food and Land Usage Coalition of Universities and Environmental Organizations says current agricultural practices contribute to food shortages and global warming. Rudy Elmendorf has more from Kisumu, Kenya. Nothing unusual about these loaves of bread, but there is a difference. This bread was baked using flour derived from crickets. In Kisumu, Kenya, 54-year-old farmer Charles Odira is rearing insects usually known for their chirping. He got the idea to raise them for food 
after visiting a farming fair in Thailand. When I went there and I saw how they were rearing crickets there, how it was helping the, uh, the, the, the poor, the malnourished, how it was uh, uh, bringing income to the farmers, then when I came back, I came back a cricket farmer. Odira started with 50 crickets he trapped in the wild. Now, a few years later, he has a colony of up to 300,000 insects. They thrive on chicken feed and plant leftovers. According to scientists at the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi, or ICIPE, crickets are good for human consumption. Crickets are very rich uh, in protein, ranging between 62 to 65 percent, which is superior to that of meat, which ranges between 25 to 30 percent. Insect protein will be very good for lactating mothers, as well as uh, children less than five years. Odira has built a network of 100 cricket farmers, but there is a threat. A bacterial infection nearly obliterated the colonies in the whole region, and farmers had to start again from scratch. They are recovering with support of ICIPE. The benefits of cricket farming prompted the Food and Land Usage Coalition to propose raising insects as a way to tackle food shortages. Scientists at ISIPA agree with some conditions. The traditional food system which was based on wild harvesting has to be uh, 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 enhanced or improved uh, with the new mass rearing techniques, uh, with uh, better understanding on the, on the safety of these insects. Uh, so that uh, it can be taken up by large uh, communities. And because of less intensive farming methods, crickets help reduce global warming, according to the Food and Land Usage Coalition. The crickets in Odira's farm are eaten or end up in bread and cookies. Fred Odiambo has various reasons for buying it. I love this bread because it gives me more energy than normal bread. And as Odiambo, for one, enjoys his cricket breakfast to the fullest, experts say it might one day feed many and help prevent conflicts in parts of the world where the population is growing and food resources are becoming more scarce. Ruth Almodorp for VOA News, Kizumu, Kenya. Now, the United States has won a record $7.5 billion award over illegal European Union subsidies to airline builder Airbus. This is the largest arbitration award the World Trade Organization has ever handed out to a complaining party. The WTO's decision is final and cannot be appealed. The U.S. brought the European Union before the WTO in 2004, accusing Britain, France, Germany and Spain of giving illegal subsidies and grants to Airbus, making its uh, commercial jets much cheaper on the global market than Airbus's chief US-based rival, Boeing. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.